Mike, turn your games down. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another recovered episode of Games My Mom Found. I am Mike Elberton, and who's who's? Would you kindly introduce yourself with me tonight? That was terrible. I am Joe Butler, and come back when you got some money, buddy. <laughs> My name is Ian Bauer. I am a guest today. Thank you very much for having me. And welcome back. You were on our Paris Eve two episode, like God, like two years ago or so. <laughs> I want to say it was pre COVID. Yeah. Oh good. yeah. No, it was twenty twenty. Because it was during, it was a long ass time ago, though. It was early COVID, I think. It was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. That's why I, I've been looking for a chance to come back and, and uh, speak with you guys. Oh, hey. Cool, Ian. Oh, uh, cool, you did Parasite Eve 2. I did Third Birthday. You got the better game. <laughs> I wouldn't, I would completely disagree on that one. <laughs> Parasite I, Eve yeah. 2 is one of the worst games I've ever played on this show, in my opinion. So, cool. well, that's, that's strong. That's strong commentary. It is. I really hated that game when I played it. Part of it is because I love Parasite Eve 1, and that game is not anything like Parasite Eve 1, so it hurt me in ways that I, I can't, I can't I, describe. You know, it's a, I played through that one in Japanese, and I think that was one of the, the reasons that I, I was talking to you guys about it. And yeah. My wife was talking to me the other day, and she says, you know, you know, I bet if you played a video game, you could learn a different language pretty easily, and all of a sudden just Parasite Eve 2 flashed in my mind from <laughs> when I was 17. And I was like... No, she's like, no, no, but you know, you'd see the words and the language, blah, blah. And I was like, no, you know, when you've accidentally used a, you know, whatever the hell something does thinking it's a cure item only to lose your, your life multiple times <laughs> you to realize maybe it's not the best way of learning a language. No, um, cause you, you don't have the context. You know, you plus, can't read. Uh, exactly. And then third birthday had the innovative feature of losing your clothes as you slowly die, you know, kind of a sadomasochism thing going on there. That, I, I like that game. I don't know why, but I like that game from what I remember. Yeah, go listen to those episodes, but that's not why we're here. But we are here to recover. This actually wasn't planned. This kind of just happened. Bioshock, which came out and made by 2K Boston, 2K Games, published it. Ken Levine directed it. came out in 2007. We did cover this back in episode 100-something. This wasn't planned to be recovered this soon or ever, but... Because I was a guest on Nomads of Fantasy podcast, we covered this also, which came out months ago by the time you're hearing this. So go, go check that out, too. And we had just finished the Bioshock series. We had went through, we played Burial of Sea, which is, by the time you're hearing this, live by now. So go listen to that. And I wanted, I figured that it was the best retrospect to go back and look at Bioshock 1 after playing Bioshock 2, Minerva's Den, Infinite, and Burial at Sea. And kind of have that aspect of what I what our thoughts are on this game. And looking back at it after... Another few years have passed. All right. Because Joe, Joe and Ian, you, neither of you were on the episode when I first did this years ago. <laughs> so part of it was going to get some more new aspects on it. So, Ian, did you get a chance to replay Bioshock for this episode? Yes, I did. Okay. And I, it, it, it's a fun throwback to, uh, you know, before first person shooters kind of made a real, real jump in, in what they were <laughs> doing. I was kind of in the middle of that jump, I think. It's a different game. Like after playing Bioshock One, Two, and Infinite, I have a much more satisfying feeling by playing Bioshock One. Joe, are you in the same boat with me with that? Uh, yeah. I've always considered Bioshock a uh, the first Bioshock at least, and kind of Bioshock Two a first uh, first person shooter, but also a survival horror. Yeah. This game was like meeting a high school girlfriend that you were really into, but she did not care for you because man. <laughs> I was telling Mikey, and this game crashed on me like at least once every night. Every like, three times I played it, it crashed on me the first night, the second night, and I had like two or three crashes last night. I want to say I lost about three hours of progress because of it. Were you playing on the Xbox or computer? The computer. I played on PC too for this playthrough, and I didn't have any. Cr- I mean, I blew through this game fast when I played it again for this episode a couple weeks ago like it 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 was it was done but i had no crashes no issues it ran perfectly on my pc i was even able to unhook my pc from the power cord and still play it just fine <laughs> which doesn't happen with every game some games if i don't have it plugged in the power cord i everything just stalls really bad because it doesn't have enough energy to push them through. <laughs> I, I went back and played it through the xbox like i did originally and no problems I, I can't play shooters on, on controller anymore if I can help it. I'm so used to mouse and keyboard now that that's the correct way to play shooters, in my opinion. I, it, it, I to this day, can't 
can't do it that way. It's got to be control. And and I fully understand it, it is, you know, it, it's a hard jump either way. Um, I'm also the same guy that uses the sticks inverted. Oh you my know. God. You're right. I, I blame my dad. Psychopath. <laughs> It's my dad's fault growing up. He, uh, he was like, oh, you got to have to, uh, you know, down is up and up is down. And, you know, and it, it's hard to to get precise aiming with a controller. But, yeah. There's always still, auto aim assist and built in. Whoa, whoa. I'm not a heathen. All right. <laughs> I mean, it's always built in a little bit with, with controller. You might not notice it because it can be very subtle sometimes, but it, it's always yeah. there. It is not like GoldenEye where, oh, look, you're looking somewhat on the left side of the screen. All right, aim and hit him. It's more of as you get close to a target, it will help make sure you, when it realizes what you're doing, to help you stay on your target. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, kind of speaking of what what I was saying, it was in that middle of that leap of going from, you know, say of a a GoldenEye Halo experience to, to, you know, something else. You know, this came out right before Call of Duty 4. Hmm. I think about it. So, you know, it was kind of... It was in a in an interesting time where you know things were getting ready to have this massive advancement in first person shooters, and I guess I remember getting Call of Duty for for Christmas that year, and what this game came out in August or September or something of two thousand seven, and then to get Call of Duty four was this kind of you know spiritual first person shooter awakening, where it's like oh oh wow, <laughs> look what we're doing. I mean. It's because Call of Duty 4 is much more of a of a regular multiplayer shooter and type of style where this game is it's a shooter, but it's going much for like Joe said earlier, it does it does go for the survival horror type thing. I mean, less survival, but there is horror in this game, especially if you don't play on easy where everybody can die pretty quickly because you're you're scavenging for supplies all the time. You're going out of your way to explore because you need said supplies to get through the game. I mean, it, it has the aspects that. Also, you have you have a health bar that doesn't just refill because after Halo, most games have a refilling health bar that becomes the thing in a first person shooter. Yeah. Also, story is not ever usually a focus. Like Call of Duty Four has a decent story, but that's not the focus of the game. The focus is just the shooting and the way the combat feels. Yeah. So, so uh, one thing is I mentioned of survival horror, and I'm I'm a huge survival horror person. You know, I've I've played literally the entire Resident Evil series and things like that. And this also suffers the same thing from Resident Evil. And every survival horror uh, game does that involves combat, which is the last third of the game just becomes a huge shooting gallery and a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just sometimes I feel like games like that feel the need to just make you use things that you collected throughout the game. Like when I was replaying this and one thing and now after especially after playing all the Bioshocks that I really fall in love with with Bioshock one is that the game makes me use ammo and weapons that I wouldn't normally use. I'm not just sticking to one gun. I'm using multiple different items. I'm trying different things. I'm do and I like that. I mean, there were, I only use one plasmid because that's me unfortunately in gaming. <laughs> but I experiment with everything else. I experiment with the different guns. I use the wrench. I use everything for different situations as I run out of ammo and I think that's one thing about this game that really draws me in more than well, two does too, but more than infinite does because I I found out that I love scavenging in game. Rise of Tomb Raider, for example, I scavenged nonstop in that game, and I fell in love with that game <laughs> because of that. I, you know, it, and the one thing that I really appreciate about this game is I love when you upgrade a weapon, and the weapon cosmetically shows it. Yeah, you know, you'd upgrade your your Tommy gun or your pistol or whatever, and all of a sudden, you know, there's like pistons coming out of it, or it's shooting steam, or you know grows a second head you know i, I don't know what it's doing but <laughs> or when you you have a plasma attached and and you're using the wrench and all of a sudden it you know freezes or it lights on fire or, you know wh- whatever's going on it, just the little touches like that are something i really appreciate in a game and i also can't emphasize how much i appreciate wrench being key one one or two just it isn't it isn't the V key, it isn't just a random button, it's just switch to the wrench, use the wrench. Such a simple aspect really makes me appreciate it in this game that I didn't realize that. Because in, in Infinite, for example, I played on PC, it was the V key. And that was really hard for me to want to use it, even though it's simpler in a shooter that your bash is a button, but when you're playing on keyboard and you don't look at the controls, it's not as easy. <laughs> Yeah, clearly none of the enemies in that world can, you know, play dodgeball because they sure as hell going to dodge my wrench. 
Yeah, no, that 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 Bioshock Infinite bled through, Mike. I was there's times where I was playing and now someone would turn and run in my face and they'd be like, oh, why is it my melee? Oh, wait, that's right. I'm playing the original Bioshock. <laughs> um, but I, I like that. And I think that's also a compliment compliment to this game is how well it makes you have to scavenge and use supplies and change up your your ways of playing. I'm assuming, especially in the harder difficulties, you really have to change up your weapons and use different plasmids. I mean, on easy, I can just use the shock plasma almost the entire game and get by just fine. Because that's how I play, unfortunately. But I also use plasmids a lot more this playthrough than I did my first playthrough of this game, or my back when we did the first episode. I, I, I found myself using it a lot more. What'd you, what'd you use? I still use shock. I use fire and freeze, but those are, I, I only use those three. I will not use anything else. Not bees? Uh, I can't. I just, I don't like bees. Oh, I love bees. So you a bees fan, Ian? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of anything I can throw at somebody and just watch them lose their mind in a game. <laughs> you know, whether it's like a, you know, a poison dart that causes them to see things or, you know, just watch them start dancing around and just, uh, you know, be in the background and just abuse myself with, oh, look at that giant idiot in that <laughs> armor dancing around like a nut. I did that, you know, and just continually harass them, just whittling down their life. It brings me unlimited happiness. I'm I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you brought up a little bit earlier the the weapon customization thing in this game is the main reason why I fell in love with the, this game Bioshock originally and I wish more games would do it but uh, funny enough uh, I did a lot of looking through through uh, for Bioshock Infinite because that whole game has like three games made before it and I uh, Ian did you know that Bioshock Infinite actually had weapon upgrades and they scrapped it for no fucking reason are you serious Yep Oh. Those those wet those red weapons you find were supposed to be like the final upgrades for the guns, and they just scrapped it because they're stupid. Oh, that's so I love the weapon upgrade system in Bioshock One and Two, where you have to go and search and go out of your way and find these certain stations that then let you choose what weapon to upgrade. I, and that it, that's also something that I love to. I love just sitting down and and tinkering with with. You know, the weapons, seeing what's going to work, what's going to not, you know, oh, what's within my budget? Oh, crap. I, I don't have enough scrap metal to do the upgrade for the Tommy gun. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to go back in and, and find it. OK, finally, I have enough. And yeah. You know, and then and then to see that change on the weapon is even more exciting to me. It looks mm. good. I mean, yeah. I, that's the only thing that really like and it always they make it glow on all the weapons. Too, so, you know, exactly what got added to your gun and seeing it change and feeling the effects of it and just the fact that it gives you that reason to explore because i forget what i think they're called power to the people but they are not common things to find is it power to people in this game or am i thinking infinite yes it's power okay. people they're not common they're very they're hidden off the beaten path i only because this playthrough where i rushed it i only found a couple i did not find that many i was usually only yeah i was mainly just using weapons that were just regular because i didn't really find upgrades because i just wasn't i was exploring but not the same kind of exploring when i played this for the show the first time because i was trying to play multiple games for the show <laughs> so i wasn't that wasn't in the mood you know but speaking I, of go ahead i'm sorry i just i just love that aspect of it that you do get to see the cosmetic change because i there's in my history of gaming the first game that i remember really doing a cosmetic change was summoner for ps2 which i i doubt holds up and I remember being so excited by that. And, and it's a simple thing in a first person shooter, seeing your weapon changes. Awesome. You know, the, the one thing I like to do is with weapons, especially at the beginning of a game, is something I like to call a fruit test. But yeah, I remember playing through Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid 2, and you'd shoot, you know, a, a piece of fruit or a bottle or something. It was like <laughs> 2001, and it would explode. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, going in the, and I very remember, distinctly remember doing this in Infinite, but, you know, you'd shoot things at the fruit stand. Oh, there's just a little bullet hole. Nothing happens there. It's stunning that 20 something years later, you know, whether it's Infinite or Bioshock or whatever, and that was only 10 years after Metal Gear Solid 2, you'd shoot a piece of fruit and nothing happens. Also, you know? Metal Gear Solid 2, it's only in the tanker because it was a tech demo type thing, too. Well, you can't have part fruit of it. In, the, in the rest of the game. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> I think you can. I think there's a little bit of stuff you can do in like the kitchen on the plant, but it's the aspect of screwing with things isn't as much of a thing besides a tanker. Yeah, I guess that's true. If I remember right. You might be right. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. We played it on the show, but I can't remember much about it anymore. Uh, the tanker has that weird ice thing. It was you shoot an ice bucket. Oh, and the ice slowly melts? Yeah, and the ice slowly melts, and the bucket bu uh, jumps around. Yeah, but, you know, it, 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 
kind of going back to the weapon, the, the weapon ju- designs are just great. You know, it, it's a really good mix of of kind of like steampunk, but something that looks like it may actually work in a weird way. <laughs> you know, kind of like Tomb Raider, where it's oh, I just wrapped a bunch of you know leather strips around the 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 pistol grip. All right, now all of a sudden my gun doesn't kick back when I shoot. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm okay with that video game thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is a little fair. It, yeah. yeah, I also really like Tomb Raider 2013 and Rise of Tomb Raider. So. <laughs> Those games are oh. great. They are, mm-hmm. and like Bioshock One does a good like. Also, like, since we're talking about combat, I still want to keep going there with the weapons. Like all the weapons feel good. The shotgun feels oh. great. Like I have played oh, yeah. many games at this point, but I love the shotgun in Bioshock One. It is. Bioshock 2, I think, had a good one, too. It, it just feels very hefty. It has that, you know, a good hit to it, and it's a very good weapon. I use it constantly in this game, and, you know, I run out of ammo, and I switch it up, and also, every gun, most, I think it's every gun, will have different ammo types that you can use, like the pistol has armor-piercing rounds, and I forget what else it has. Is, is it armor-piercing Is armor piercing and what? Hum- and or organic or something? Yeah, no, it's uh, armor-piercing and anti-personal. Okay, that's what it was. I, I I don't use antipersonal in general for some reason. I just shoot people, I guess. I don't know. Easy doesn't matter. <laughs> just shoot people. <laughs> well, and easy well, does. You don't have to switch up the ammo as much that when you run out of stuff. Like, it, it's a yeah. different... The game is not hard on easy. Oh, I don't know. I had a pretty hard time. But then again, I was, you know, trying to speed, speed roll through it, so... And everything was crashing on you. Yeah, that too. <laughs> and I gotta say, I do like the fact in Bioshock 1 that there's nobody going, Here, Booker, take this! I completely do not miss that one bit. <laughs> not at all. Much as I love Elizabeth, one of the best characters ever, I'm completely happy with nobody being like, here, take this, here, need ammo, here, need a med kit, here, whatever you need, I got it. Is she better or worse than Ashley? She's way better, but it just, it, it takes away something that I, for, that I forget about, that I loved until I replayed the Bioshock one, is the whole scavenging aspect, the whole of having the reason to explore to go find more ammo, to go find more, you know, a equi- crafting equipment to make ammo or to make something, which I didn't really do in this playthrough. But just that aspect of not having someone give you everything that it makes me do that more in this game. See, I kind of feel differently because I, I like having a buddy when I'm going through kind of any any game, you know, especially kind of a pseudo horror shooter. Where it's okay, you know, I'm I'm here. Life sucks, but at least I got a friend, you know, to to kind of throw things at me. And, you know, even if it's computer controlled, at least there's somebody else there, you know, that kind of may or may not have your back, depending on how dumb they act at the time. But, you know, if if the the price of that is, you know, kind of some incessant chatter every once in a while, I'm I'm okay with that. I would like it more if Elizabeth didn't just take away that aspect from me. But that's a different game. That's much more of a shooter where this is much more exploration horror. Yeah, that's true. But also in horror games, I mean, we're notorious for having a character go, hey, look, a zombie. I'm going to leave you alone and I'm going to go search the other side of the mansion. I'll, I'll come find you later. Like, you know, that, hey, people all make great decisions in horror games. Yeah, so speaking of horror games and having people talk, I would be extremely disappointed if they ever remastered this and let Jack talk because I'd probably end up ripping my own eyeballs out. <laughs> well, I don't think you can have Jack talk. Part of the specialty of this game is having Jack be a silent protagonist. You can't have him talk, but like I know, Dead Space remastered. They're bringing back. I want to say they're bringing back the original Isaac Clark voice actor, and they're letting him talk in the first game now. That's, I, I don't like it, but I get it. But also, I think with Bioshock, because of the story, oh, and there will be spoilers for Bioshock, obviously, and other stuff. I think I, I can't remember if I said that or not. But it, it's just it's ob- it's one of those things where it's very like it would change the mo- the way of the game because the whole point of the game is all would you kindly and the fact that you're being herded along by an NPC because that's how video games work and you have to do what the game makes you do to progress the game. And the and you are Jack. So if he, if you take that away and give Jack a voice, it, it takes away the immersion of you being Jack and you having to follow the... Would you kindly pick up that wrench? Would you kindly pick up that radio? It takes away that in a way that would not work. So you can't in this game. You cannot give him a voice. It it also really helps dignify when like you finally get the big twist, which by the way is my like top three twist of all time, yeah. in no specific order. It also helps cement that Jack is a freak because you you get to that like picture and then the whole reveal like oh yeah no you're barely like two years old and it's like oh yeah this explains a lot. 
there is so much iconic about that game between that scene it's a circus of values would you kindly you know all these different little kind of things within that game you still remember what 15 years later how many games can say that where you remember the twist to a game there's a few you know kind of talk about dead space where you know isaac is insane or this <laughs> where you know you you meet dad for the first time and it's not a happy reunion and you know there's just if you can still recite the goofy little sound clips from something 15 20 years later that game has done something right you know, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm still at the grocery store and, you know, just to my side, it's a circus of values. My <laughs> wife thinks maybe she's married an insane person, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're still saying this to yourself. That game has done something, I think, that, that yeah. cemented oh, yeah. as, as, you know, a, a top 10 game. I mean, so. this game also, I have to make this joke, but when I, at some point our Facebook group where we all met, I watched the entire Oakland Super Replay did a thing where they voted and this was the number one for person shooter. I don't agree with that, but I get it. <laughs> well, two things. One is, yeah, so it's speaking of Dead Space, that in like no, with top three, no specific order is the Would You Kindly, the ending of Dead Space, and then the James reveal for Silent Hill 2. It's top three. <laughs> top three tools. And then, um, have you ever played Draken Guard? Yes. Once, a long time ago. I have a copy behind me somewhere, but yes. So, so my husband likes to do this thing during horror movies because we both love horror movies too where like the twist comes or something really weird happens and i forgot what we were watching recently but the movie got super quiet and then my husband leans over to me and goes is this the land of the gods and i cracked up super hard that we had to pause the movie <laughs> <laughs> right, dragon guard is the, mo- is the game with the giant babies right yes I, okay dragon guard thought- was kind of game of thrones before game of thrones oh yeah completely it's- I, I need to replay it someday for this show, but I just, yeah, it's not on my list anytime too soon. But yes, that, that game plays jank. That's all. Oh, it's not good. <laughs> it's, it's, very pretty. It be, it just... it, it's that it's that very specific time in the PlayStation 2 library where everything was kind of like, you know, they were still trying to figure out just how far they could go with graphics on things. And so it's very pretty. But, you know, it's it's the pretty dumb girl that you are like, hmm, all right, that's fun to hang out with for a little bit. <laughs> And uh, now I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I love going back and replaying games, even if it isn't a positive experience, the, you know, but I still love it. So I can't help it. Yeah. Also, I love revisiting. I have a thing for Square. So <laughs> that's a big part, of it. especially old Square. I'm trying to cover a lot of the Square soft games and Square Enix games on the show or in Enix games eventually. They're hard because they're most of them are long, but that's one of my goals. Another thing we had mentioned about combat that, that I think really does improve combat Bioshock 1 also is the is the camera system. I didn't use the camera system a lot my first playthrough. This playthrough I used it a lot more. I mean, just what you do is you get a camera, you take pictures of enemies and then you get by taking more pictures of said of different enemies and different sequences, you get upgrades. You also will unlock special plasmas which are we haven't talked about yet, which are can enhance your character and make and give you more buffs and things of that nature. And just that aspect, like I really enjoy taking pictures in the, in this and seeing the change and seeing how quicker enemies would go down and the advantages you get. Yeah, I, yeah. I did the same surprisingly. I don't think I ever really used the camera, but this time around I did, and I actually had a little bit more fun with the game because of it. That's good, though. I mean, that's what it's there for. Yeah, and then it, 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 that started to become kind of a, a thing in games for a while where you'd, you'd photograph or you know sketch or whatever it was of an enemy, and you'd learn more and more about it. But it helps. It also helps you immerse in the experience of the game and the experience that you get from it like it really you get immersed which we haven't talked about yet you get immersed in this world yeah it, it literally <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i i love that like i mean part of the thing that makes Bioshock stand out and so memorable is that rapture is such a memorable place to be it's an underwater city it's full of as we went in an earlier episode it's full about hyper capitalism and what would happen if you take away morals and you take away those ideas that hold us back, thank God, for, you know, not being insane <laughs> people and turning little girls into frickin' like factories of a drug, for lack of a better term. Like it's just but everything about this world, it's so unique. And that's what I think makes Bioshock one and two to me two of my favorite shooters that I have played in recent memory because of just that nature of it, where Infinite doesn't have that. And and it's all a commentary on something, but I think you go to Bioshock one and you can see if we're not careful that 
that's the path we could go down, you know, in, in real life, you know, we're, we're, I've been having this conversation a lot lately with people, but you know, it, it, we all want the, that's a strong, let me rephrase that. There are people that want <laughs> the safeguards and, and everything taken off. Oh, there's too much government and things. We need to let people, you know, manage themselves. And, and well, Reagan did that with trickle down economics. You know, look how well that's working out. If you want a real fascinating history, look at the history of milk, you know, before the government came in, they're like, oh, we're going to put chalk in the in your milk and cyanide and everything just to, you know, give you more of it. And it's like, well, OK, you know, we we don't have anybody at the switch. We need somebody responsible. And when you take away that responsibility, you have rapture, you know, and and it's it's kind of, uh, you know, we're only a few steps removed from from chaos. And, and it's interesting when you look at that, where it's like we had the best of intentions to build this place where nothing but the best was going to be here. But we also took away everybody's safeguards and responsibilities. And now we have a drugged out society of nuts wearing rabbit masks, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, ODing on, on, on slug goo. So, you know. it, it's also the way that the game drops you into rapture after rapture has went to hell you had you had a war kind of start you had you don't and you don't get to see that like a lot of games would have had flashbacks or maybe they even had a reference that well in the clone wars i did this and then you know get back to it years later it doesn't it doesn't i mean there's a book yes but it does a good job of of giving you pieces of what happened enough pieces for you could actually have a coherent story about what fontaine did but you don't you don't have to, you don't get to see it you're not there. You're just in what's left of this utopia. And what, it makes perfect sense that people had really went just kind of insane. And, I, and that's what makes it so good. Such a good experience. I, that left their I, own devices. These people, you know, were not. I mean, it's the idea, like, you know, if, if, if communities fall, if you lose law and order, you will eventually get this will happen because people realize, well, if I can if I can do what I want, and there are no consequences then I can take charge. So no matter, so I mean, I don't agree with stuff like this, but that's what it is a good, it is a, a counterculture, I think counterculture example of what could happen. The idea, I think the best way to say it. I think like one of the good things that I liked about this, which it's all like, like we were talking about how the game kind of tells you its story without really telling you. One of the things I kind of noticed, or yeah, I mean, pretty sure everyone knows that whenever you play it the first time or whatever. But one thing I always thought I thought about while playing this too is like, man, Originally, like Andrew Ryan's supposed to be the bad guy of this and everything else. And then when everything switches over to Fontaine, you kind of look back and then eventually realize, oh, there really is someone worse than Ryan. And this is just progressively getting worse <laughs> over time because like Fontaine does not give a shit about no one as opposed to Ryan. who's like, oh, I just kind of want a utopia. It got pretty fucked up. But, you know, at least people liked being alive in my utopia. <laughs> I mean, that's also like the thing about the characters that you have Andrew Ryan and you have Frank Fontaine slash Atlas. And they're they're maybe two sides of the same coin in a way, but different aspect. They're both different like extremes. And once and Andrew Ryan is very in the extreme of should man be able to, you know, appreciate the work of his of his own bro, not not, you know, not give it to like Soviet Union where it's for the people or, you know, like that aspect of you get, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps very much where Fontaine is much more of. He wants to take advantage of the situation because he makes a comment, not in this game, but a burial sees like, well, somebody's got to clean the toilets around here. Like, it's that idea that, you know, somewhat of that somebody has to be in charge and is, should take advantage of other people that are stupid, essentially. Mm -hmm. Is is Andrew Ryan supposed to be Walt Disney? I believe it. Like him. And then Fontaine is, I guess, the, you know, old version of the new Trump. I mean, like, <laughs> it's interesting to see these parallels. I was watching this thing about Walt Disney about two or three years ago, and, and everything Disney was doing is kind of what Andrew Ryan was doing. Disney's like, why are the animators on strike? Because they're going <laughs> blind and getting arthritis? They have a job at Disney. And Andrew Ryan says, hey, you get to live in Utopia. Why are you so upset? And people are like, well, because we're we're dying. And he's like, no, that's not a reason to be upset. You know, <laughs> like, I, I think my favorite part, I think it's also in burial at sea. When you kind of realize it too, you realize, you know, rapture's not that bad. You know, people work for who they work for. And, you know, you, you have a choice to get hopped up on slug goo, but I think the big turning point for everyone is like, Oh yeah, I could totally get down with this. And then it goes, 
why should you, why should poor people have to pay for medical insurance when you have the money for it? It's like, oh, oh no, this is bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because in, in Infinite and in Burial C, they make that comment where they're like, why should he get free insurance when you pay, had to pay for your insurance? And it, it really shows you that's what Rapture is in a sense. And it's not good as we see first. <laughs> but I mean, in that, I mean, this game came out in 2007, but this game still has so many political vibes that fit in today's world that you can still connect with. I mean, again, it's one, I mean, this is also based on the book Atlas Shrug, which I've never read, but I, we did talk about it in length in our, in the previous episode. Bill's knew of it and had a lot to say. <laughs> Not good things about it, but he had a lot to say. And it's just a different idea. It's, but it also really shows you what happens if you let a world just run free without morals. Well, you know, because I'm speaking of books, I'm reading Airframe right now from Michael Crichton. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. It's about a, a, I a, he's amazing. It's about a company that builds aircraft. You know, just the aircraft itself, not the engines and all that other stuff. But the, it's kind of a, you know, what happens when we've taken all the the safeties off of the news and let them, you know, reporters dictate what the story is, not the story dictate it. You know, what happens if when we deregulate the FAA and we deregulate all these things because somebody at the top said, well, I can make an extra 50 bucks if we pull all the safeties off. You know, and it, it's kind of an interesting commentary on that. And and that's kind of, again, like going going to another part of this conversation, you know, there, you're always going to, somebody's always going to have to work for somebody, you know, and all these people were going there thinking, hey, you know, we're, I'm the best runner, I'm the best artist, I'm the best somebody. Well, you still have to report to somebody at the end of the day, you know, and, and somebody's still going to have to be at the bottom because the best <laughs> isn't always going to be the best. And so, you know, you could see where people get, kind of a little little antsy and just kind of you know reading into subcontext here but you know it's just it's interesting to see you know even with the best of intentions just how wildly bad things can go i mean also to to comment on that i've been watching docu i've been obsessed with documentaries lately i watched something about boeing and i watched something about three mile island incident nuclear reactor and both of those you had people making decisions that well we need to make more money so we don't need safety things we'll just take them out of here nobody will notice it's the same idea. And Rapture, I want to say there are there are points in, in Rapture, as you listen to audio tapes and things, that do mention that that's partly what they're, is that profit, in a way, matters more. I, I want to say there are comments like that. I, uh, you also have that doctor that created you. I don't think we mentioned her. <laughs> What's her name? I want to call her Tesla, but I know that's not it. Tenenbaum. 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 You know, I mean, you have unregulated medical practices going on. Oh, we're going to make a two-year-old adult that's a mercenary assassin. Maybe not the best use of our time and energy. <laughs> so my my favorite thing is that goes progressively worse because you have Tenenbaum who, even though she's a scientist and she admits she's done some bad things, she's still trying to help out little sisters. And then you have, how we're talking about how you have uh, two sides of a coin, Ryan and Fontaine. You have the completely two 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 opposite sides of a coin Tenenbaum and Su Chong Su Chong who like can't understand why children can't love something and it has to be in the DNA and he's willing to cut open a thousand children to figure out why this is it's very Nazi <laughs> oh I mean Su Chong is terrible and it's really not until when you play Burial at Sea which came years later and they retcon stuff you can like you see at one point the little sisters just with masks on before they've been really changed by what happens and like the comments that they make like i, I think also playing burial at sea and you have a scene where you see rapture before the before the war and what happens and then replaying this game I, re I literally played burial at sea beat that and then the next day started bioshock one and that doing that twists your brain in an interesting way where it really makes you go my god that would happen to this place and it was a very uh, interesting interesting effect by the way mike you owe me a nickel. I was totally right. That's totally you. Totally find uh, Shu Chong the same way in Bioshock One as, you, as the oh, end. Oh, okay. Of I thought it was a little different then. I thought it was a different room or something. No, he. You find him on the table in. Uh, well, it is a different room, but you find him the same way where he's like face down with a drill up his butt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Way I hope to go. <laughs> same. Speaking of little <laughs> sisters, just on and off. I was talking to my wife about this podcast yesterday. She's like, "Oh, what are you guys talking about?" So Bioshock. Oh, so I showed her the synopsis on Wikipedia. Let me tell you, when somebody that doesn't know anything about the game reads Big Daddies and Little Sisters out loud, 
<laughs> it makes it sound real bad. Uh-huh. Like, oh, I mean, you're not wrong. My my wife, I was talking about, I'm like, oh, I just killed a big daddy. She's like, what? No, I gotta go save. The, I gotta go save the little sister. She's like, what the fuck are you playing? So I completely understand. <laughs> Yeah, she, she said it out loud. I said, I never realized how ridiculous that sounds because I've never said the words out loud mm-hmm. until somebody else says it out loud. I was like, hmm. I don't All understand. Right. I think it's more of the fact that Big Daddy is such a, a phrase that really like makes it memorable. Like if you just call them bouncers or you just call them, you know, something Mr. else, it, Mr. Bubbles, it wouldn't have the same effect. And I think that's why yeah. they did it. But I also like it when en- when enemies like in a world like this have a name that fits the character. Like Halo is an example where they have like, oh, they're called jackals because it's just the Marines naming the things that they're killing all the time. It's not their actual yeah. name. And I and and that would have been okay if like he just decided, oh, they're big. But they, I mean, Rapture calls them they're big daddies and little sisters. Like I don't understand why he didn't just come up with some different name. Well, um, yeah. or just call them sisters and I don't know something. I mean, Ian brings it up. Earlier, it's perfectly point. It's kind of like the whole weird Disney syndrome. You can't call, you can't give these things threatening names and be like, "Oh yeah, no, it's all, it's all good down here." We've got big semen and 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 <laughs> you know, hopped up on slug goo little girls. No, it's it's big daddies and little sisters. And then you have a a poster which I will pay someone money for to make me do a poster, which is like I, I I'm pretty sure it's in Bioshock One, but I couldn't find it. Where it has like what a big daddy's supposed to look like, and it's like a dude with the pants on. He's got a drill on his yeah. arm, and it's like a buff blonde man. And then what is it? It's like you can trust this big daddy, and it's just the way like the '60s work. You know, smoke cigarettes; they make you look prettier. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually watching Mad Men right now, so it's a whole different conversation about that. But yeah, this, this is <laughs> for an interesting time. <laughs> You know, kind of, kind of touching on the on the big daddy thing, man. The first time you see one of those, and it just literally drills that splicer to the wall. Yeah, and you're like, oh god, I do not want to go against that. And then, I mean, that game suffers from the same problem that every other game does. You know, eventually you you become strong enough to where it's like, you know, whatever. All right, oh whale call, great. All right, well this means I'm. Do I have enough ammo? Yeah, I sure. All right, let's go kill it. You know, but that first time you see it. You know, you see it on the cover of the game. It's in all the 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 advertising, and then you come across when you, oh my god, <laughs> I have to fight that thing. So, I mean, and they're they're good fights too. Like that's and they're you know like the whole risk and reward where you can just leave big daddies alone. You don't have to fight them, but by fighting them, you get the special aspect of you get to get the little sister. You can either harvest them or save them, which then gives you Adam, which lets you upgrade your plasmids and your stats. Essentially, you can have more health care, you know, things of that nature, have more upgrades that will affect your stats in other ways. So it's a very risk and reward. I also, cause I, when we, I played this game for the show last time I, and I'm on Steam and I got the achievements for being the good guy. I'm like, okay, this time I'm going to kill the sisters. I started the game, went to go harvest the first one did nope and saved every other one I did. I just couldn't do it. Could not bring myself to do it. I can't. I can't be evil in a game. So I've never harvested one through two playthroughs. So it's <laughs> you. You get less Adam because you get more Adam at once, but you get less Adam in the grand scheme of things. So, but I just it's don't just, like it. It's just never worth it. Like you, you always end up getting. Ooh, it's sixty bucks. You can buy it now. It's a big daddy plush on the two K store. Because um, <laughs> I really want one. The, you. There's no there's a worse repercussion if you if you harvest them, because as long as you save them every three, I believe, little sisters, you save ten and bombs like, oh, the girls love you so much. Here's a doll with like 200 extra Adam and, you know, health kits. And maybe even, I think you even get like a new plasma plasma you can't buy or find or anything in those dolls. So there's no reason to harvest any of them whatsoever. <laughs> I won't do it. I, I, I can't. I mean, I was even going to do it like for the achievement because I'm like, yeah, I get I mean, even I don't give a shit about Steam achievements anymore, or any achievements. So I was like, oh, I not. And I'm like, nope, 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 nope. I can't do it. I can't do it. I know it's about too, it's too disgusting. And the idea that you're just killing these little girls, just I can't. I can't. It's very I capitalist like, nope. thing to do. Mm-hmm. The, o- the only bad thing I do is uh, whenever you play Mass Effect and the reporter comes up, I have to punch her in the face. It's the only yeah. it's the only bad thing that I can do. <laughs> That's different, yeah. though. That's not like I need to replay Mass Effect, but. It doesn't, it's not as evil as I feel like, oh, maybe you can be evil in that game. I'm never evil in that game either, so. <laughs> <laughs> I also am surprised how well Bioshock holds up in over all this time that we were saying earlier, and how the, I don't think the game is too long. I think it's 
just the it, I mean, yes, the last area does get a little repetitive, but the game feels long enough for the most part. Oh, mind. yeah. I beat this at even speeding through this. If I want to say I beat this at 10 hours, it's great, great time for a game. Yeah, it, that's yeah. about my perfect time. I don't want a game to be 20 hours, 30 hours. You know, I just I mean, I do play games that are longer. I used to love RPGs, but now I just I can't. Even if I didn't have the podcast, I can't play really long games. I want to move on to the next thing. Looking at you, Elden Ring. <laughs> I do. I, I love Bioshock or not. Bioshock, I do love Bioshock one, but I love Dark Souls one and two. And I have and, and Bloodborne, but I haven't touched Dark Souls three or Elden Ring because I have a podcast and I can't make that function. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I want to go back and talk more about how the Andrew Ryan thing that we that's always like the, the famous plot twist. Like we we mentioned it, but as you get there, like everything leading up to that, that's when you find out that you're being you're being controlled by every time you say, would you when they say, would you kindly, you have to do what they tell you to. That's at the same time when you learn all those aspects of it. You learn that Andrew Ryan is your father and that you were essentially a test tube baby that was genetically enhanced and, and altered. And that's when everything comes to play in this little section. But it's also such a good thing because Andrew Ryan kind of went crazy at this point where he's very much like, you know, he lets you kill him because he just doesn't care anymore. He's he's done with Rapture. He's going to let the whole play blow up because he just finished. And I think that's a very good aspect, too, to kind of like talk about the character itself. I think it's an interesting thing to do to in your game that you're trying to sell to gamers saying, ha ha, you guys are pawns. You do exactly what we tell you to do and you like it and you're going to do it again because after you finish this, you're going to go buy another game. And that game's going to tell you what to do, and you're going to do it without even thinking about it. And it's like, huh, that that is interesting, and you're correct, sir. I did go and buy another game, and I did <laughs> exactly what they told me to do. I think that next game was Assassin's Creed. Oh, man. <laughs> I do like that game a lot. I love Assassin's Creed. <laughs> haven't played it in years, but I, I haven't really liking it. In this game, like you, there's a one scene where you become a big daddy, which, eh, I mean, that that's kind of padding, I feel, a lot in this game. But it's still... Especially after playing Bioshock 2. But, I mean, you're not really a big daddy. You're just a guy who got put on a suit and got one thing that was changed where they did the voice. But that's it. Oh, you mean the weakest big daddy in the history of the whole series where, oh, yes. I, I killed by a splicer, even though. Because uh, you're not I really a big shoot. daddy. You're just, you put on the boots, you put on the, you put on the helmet, you're, you're just, and you put on the pheromones. It's not really. Deep. You're not going through all the augmentation that a big daddy goes through, because I mean, you find out as the series progresses and Bioshock two, I think they mentioned it maybe in this game in the audio diary somewhere, but it's kind of a, it's it's like if you're, if you're a convict or someone that was, you, they turn you into a bio daddy. It's not by, it's not your choice. I mean, you're a mind warped creature at this point. True. And, and I like that aspect too. I like the aspect of everything just goes to hell. <laughs> really I like seeing this hyper capitalist society just fall apart because they're terrible. <laughs> makes me happy in a weird way for some reason i i really don't like i think this is like the only like really bad part of this game is i really don't like the turning into a big daddy and the big daddy gauntlet just because it, it really does feel like padding like i can understand at least being like having the gauntlet because you could but overall you could really just change the whole point of it like oh hey you know the the sisters trust you enough because you've been doing stuff. You could even change it to where if you because you've been killing so many of them, they're scared of you. But like turning into a big daddy is just completely useless in this game. And then it's even worse is you put the helmet on and it completely fucks up your field of vision too. Which I don't <laughs> know. Is the whole game like a parody on a game in a sense where it's okay now you're getting a chance to be the boss like in some other games. Okay. Now you're, you know, in metal gear or you're something else. So you're finally kind of invincible for a little bit. I mean, is, is that maybe the idea that they were going for here? Probably it makes the most I mean, sense. I mean, even though you're still, you know, a total pushover compared to an actual, you know, <laughs> one, but you know, I mean, that seems like that was the idea is okay. Now you're the boss. Okay. You can kind of run through and you're a little stronger. You don't have to worry about ammo and, blah 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 and maybe it just didn't achieve the the goal they were going for there they didn't really try because they, they didn't want to alter the game too much i feel at that time yeah this probably. part also feels kind of rushed because you're you're kind of funneled through an area there's much less exp exploration there's a small part where the little sister has to harvest two dead bodies and i remember when we first played this and i'm like oh okay this is okay and they're like wait till you play bioshock 2 <laughs> and <laughs> after beating bioshock 2 i'm like yeah i, I completely get it now I don't I don't like having to 
And that was also a nice thing in this aspect, in this game where you don't have to protect the little sisters. You just go after you beat the big daddy, you're done. You move on. It isn't like Bioshock 2 where you have to then go and run around with little sisters so they can harvest Adam and then go through all that protecting. That was nice. And set traps. Never set traps. Any of my playthroughs, all three games, all four times. <laughs> don't ever set traps. I will not set traps. I just no interest. Even when the game tells me to don't do it. So <laughs> we haven't talked about the pipe hacking mini game that. I, my my opinion has changed a little bit on it. Essentially, it's God, what is it called? The actual game is based on. I uh, yeah, like from the it's, old like yes, the, old Windows days. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I can't that, remember that the name. <laughs> it's a, it's a pipe mini game where you, you you move pipes to, for the slime for the slime doesn't fill out, and I do like it. It irritates me that there are some points that are you can't win situations. You just don't have the right pieces or they completely block where you have to go. It doesn't happen a lot, but I, every time it happens, I get irritated. Cause I'm like, this is not my fault. You put me in a situation. I can't do anything. Yeah, I get that. I, I get irritated. Like it, it shouldn't have had an automatic fail in there. It should always be a way that if you're quick enough, you do have the right pieces to fix it. And there are literally times where I didn't have enough right pieces at all. Even if I was to do like the whole, you know, change, you know, use rotating pieces and, Make it. There's no way to make it work. It was just impossible because of where the blocks were and stuff, and that irritated me a lot. (laughs) I liked hacking all that stuff and just watching it create havoc. (laughs) Again, kind of going back to the whole B power. Oh, okay. I just sit back and watch it do my job for me. This is great. If I gotta (laughs) invest thirty seconds in a you know half half baked mini game, cool. Let's do it because there are much worse mini games to play. (laughs) in that time period of games so it's not terrible i also like the fact that the game freezes essentially when you do mini games and things aren't trying to kill you like when you play infinite and you're trying to hack which is not as good everything's still trying to kill you so i appreciate that the game stopped let you have that break and do it it doesn't bother me it doesn't take me out of the immersion or anything there's a hacking mini game about shock infinite sort of it's like a little meter where you have to hit the button in the green a couple times that was two i swear it's infinite no i think you can hack an infinite I don't remember. Yeah, two, yeah, two is the one where you can shoot the dart and the little meter comes up. And uh, oh, okay, yeah, and people were complaining. I remember, I remember back in the day, people were complaining about it because they wanted the pipes back, but it was it wasn't even like a we want the pipes back. It's better. It's it was a uh, no, sir. I am colorblind and I cannot hack these things. Please, please help me. There was a lot of experimentation because that was also like Gears of War, where you had to hit the reload button a second time at the right time. Either that, or you jam the clip. Um, yeah. How, what else? Like all the QTEs and Resident Evil Six. Just there's a lot of weird crap going on around that time when it came to mini games. Yeah. I, I I still I also tried I tried to Google the thing we were looking we were just talking about and I can't find it. So it was it called it. pipe. I I don't know. I couldn't. I was looking it up and I couldn't find anything about it. So I I thought it was called pipe. I found a game called Pipes. It's a free game, but it's not the pipes I'm thinking of. <laughs> more of a more of an April celebration kind of pipes. I just don't know. I can't. I just, it's just one of those vague memories. I know that's what it's based on, but I can't remember what what it was. Can I can I ask, do you guys remember the first time you remember seeing anything for Bioshock? I do. And my experience is weird. I didn't have Internet because I'm, I'm a little bit, probably a little bit younger because I'm barely 30. I'm, about, I'm 30. <laughs> uh, I had a <laughs> I had a X play growing up. So I had G4. So that's usually how I found out about what was good and what's not. And that's usually what I base my game ranking system. Everything's a five, you know, it's a five star system and not a 10 point system because 10 points never made sense to me anyways. But yeah, like X play and games like that always had like, you know, games are coming out. They give really good reviews on them. And I remember them even talking, which is a weird thing to think about because they always had like, oh, this is how you solve really hard parts in the game. And I remember X play. It was the uh, the pictures for Sander Cohen. And I guess it was probably just a because that part of the game is not hard. It's not hard. The at game, all. Yeah, it always points out, but I always feel like they did that just because it was like, a, oh, this is a good point to show off the game to get people to actually buy it. So, yeah, that probably was it. I mean, when you think about what X Play really was for, was to advertise stuff essentially. Mm-hmm. I mean, I plus, anytime you look at when people cover media, they they always try to cover the more popular media because that's going to get the most clicks and the most views. I don't. Mm-hmm. I should, but I do not. But. <laughs> so, my first uh, interaction with Bioshock that I remember personally would have been probably the cover in Game Informer would have been my first thing because I actually didn't have a 360 until 2009 I think yeah 2009 or so 
is when I first got my first 360. So and and I'd been around it like a friend of mine had it before I moved cities. So I played it, but I because when I bought Bioshock One, it was like twenty bucks, and I hated Bioshock One my first playthrough. I hated the game. <laughs> Thought it was bullshit. <laughs> now I love time change. I I, I it actually long game. I uh, I remember going into games. I had just moved to Washington State at the time, and I had been in training. For, I was in military training all that summer before. And so I got there, I was like, they had, they had the special edition up on the counter and it came with a little, I don't know, a couple inch tall figure from the game. And I, interestingly, I had gone in there for mag and I, uh, mag. <laughs> I was like, oh, that game sounds awesome. I'm going to give that a shot. And the, uh, it wasn't out yet because I was confused on the time when it was supposed to come out. But I looked at the guy said, well, what is that? And he was like, oh, it's Bioshock. It's based off a of system shock. I said, I don't know what that is. I said, but I need something to play and it looks good. Uh, you should give it a shot. All right. Now I'm kicking myself for not buying the special edition because they had one at the time. <laughs> but yeah, because they had the standee in there. They had the little figure tape and that figure was taped up on that counter for a good four or five years before it broke. But uh, I remember seeing it. I was like, OK, that looks cool. Let's give it a shot. And then remember, I was, wait- I was waiting on people to to get out to Washington State to help me move. And I sat down in my the only thing in my apartment at the time was a TV an Xbox 360 and uh, my military sleeping bag I was sleeping in and <laughs> playing Bioshock. And I was like, this is amazing. So you were that yeah. meme that, that comes around now. Some boy can live in an apartment like this and be, see nothing wrong with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you made me think of it now. Looking back on That's it now, stupid. maybe maybe not the uh, the healthiest living situation, but you know, eh, it happens. When you're young and you're, you know, things happen. I haven't lived in some of the best ways in my life multiple times, so I completely understand. Same, but <laughs> yeah, just just loading that up, and then you know, you, again, you know, the the scenes of rapture when you're going down, and I thought, ah, oh, this is this is interesting. I wonder what I'm in for. And one of the best games I've ever made. I also have no experience with System Shock one or two. I've only played two for like half an hour, maybe. So I, I also came in blind, did not realize till years later this was really part of a sort of part of a series. Yeah, so I, I've never been a PC gamer, so I uh, people will be talking to me about this stuff, and I'm like, I have no idea. You've never played System Shock because I I'm 40, so I'm a little bit older, and I'm like, nope, never played any of that stuff. Really? Yeah, well, because I never had a computer to play it on, and yeah. now that I do, I just don't care because I have you know everything else. It's everything. hard to go back to. Oh, yeah. it's fine. They're they're remastering it, so it's fine. Oh, okay. I I it's on my list of games that I need to one day play. It just hasn't happened yet. One day I'll get around to it because I, I, I want to play System Shock 1 and 2, especially 2. I think 2 I need to play to really under, to kind of wrap up Bioshock and understand the series a little better. And just I'm part of my thing is I want to go back and play games that I missed in, in life for one reason or another. So And then and then when Mike finally closes the, the chest, the Bioshock, the shock chest and goes, I'm finally done. They're going to announce the new Bioshock game. He's going to go, damn it. Well, they already <laughs> announced it. They just don't. Who knows when the hell it's coming out? Yeah, it, soon apparently because it's it's on it's on that Nvidia leak and they announced oh, Kingdom Hearts four, so it's it's coming hopefully. I'm I'm also very much in the in the terms that I don't think any game should ever revisit Rapture. I think if they do a Bioshock four, if they can whatever they do with the series, you need to walk away from this place and start somewhere fresh. I mean, I love this game and I love Bioshock one and just what it is, but I I don't think you need to you should ever be back in this world again. It's time to move away. Have they well, said anything? about about Bioshock Four, just that it's being made. Oh, <laughs> what is it? The the also the way I see it too. Bioshock Infinite kind of sets that up, and I guess it it's not it, it technically Bioshock Infinite sells did well. What it really is is Bioshock Infinite is one of the cursed threes that I always refer to, like Bio, uh, Bioshock Infinite and Dead Space Three, and there's a couple others where it's just like, oh hey look we finally did something different with the game. Yeah, but it just didn't make us more than like a billion dollars. Was it was it supposed to? Yes. So if we didn't make more than a billion dollars, the game didn't sell well, and we're never making it again. Oh, okay. I think you're, re- you're referring to Tomb Raider and SquareSoft, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but what is it? Bioshock Infinite sets up a completely like you can have. They they explain in the game. You just need the setting. Just needs to have a man in a lighthouse with fucked up values and. Then there you go. That's your game. You know, you that's another thing that makes replaying Bioshock one after going through infinite barrel at sea so much better is that you also realize that everything happens 
because of the same character, because of things that go on with Elizabeth in Bioshock Infinite then end up playing a part in why Jack is on is here, why Jack came. Like it, it does a good job with that. And the whole idea of the entire series ends up becoming was to save the little sister in infinite. It's an interesting uh, gamble to take to not fully reveal the entire plot or the answers to the plot until the very last 10 seconds of the game <laughs> where, where what they're doing mm-hmm. the, the baptism and you're like, Oh, okay. Now I get it. I, I feel like that was planned to the get go because they feel like they, cause you, you always get these games that end one of two ways. You either have everything wrap up at the end because they knew they weren't getting a sequel or you try something where they uh, they try their hardest to make the biggest cliffhanger ever and it doesn't go anywhere because the game didn't sell well. And that's what I appreciate with this game is that it was such a new thing. I mean, they had a budget, but probably not, you know, a ballooning budget where they're like, we, we got to make a good game, but they're not expecting the same amount of money you are with with sequel. I, I appreciate it. Any other last things that you guys still want to co- we haven't mentioned yet that we should cover? Just that. You know, the, that that game, like I said, and I think I mentioned this before, but it's just such an interesting game to play in 2022 where the place where, and I know this is a little political and whatever, but you know, with everything kind of going on in the world, you look at what was trying to be accomplished in the world in this game and you think, wow, you know, we just kind of need to be a little more careful with things. But then the game itself is such an interesting commentary on games you know the the would you kindly and you think back (laughs) oh god that's all of final fantasy you know hey my daughter lost her widget can you go into the forest and find it sure why not that makes absolutely no sense but you asked me to (laughs) so here we are it's like this there's so many because as people complain about there's so many stupid little side quests in role-playing games and you just you know flounce away on your merry way to go get the stupid thing come back and you're like oh, gee thanks boss i appreciate the widget you gave me in return you know and it's like <laughs> to 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 openly kind of commentate on that but also mock it at the same time is uh is kind of a kind of a an interesting thing and and nobody's done anything like that since you know and and i can't remember if ken levine was was uh, uh you know a bad guy now if he's done something recently everybody's been doing something recently that we can't (laughs) like him for well people are stupid i mean that's really in today's (laughs) age if you're somebody with some kind of famous thing maybe you shouldn't post controversial things on on a public medium like even me who i am definitely not famous i try not to say anything too questionable (laughs) on media because it's like whether i thought it or not i i you know i'm not gonna put stuff on there that's gonna make me sound like a monster like why would you do that and famous people do it all the time i don't get it i get it but i i I think it's one of those games like you know uh, whatever the gaming version of the criterion collection is is (laughs) even if it doesn't totally hold up i think it's one of those things that everybody that enjoys games in in a more serious way needs to sit down and play, you know, and, and there's a lot of games for that time period. Like I mentioned, like Assassin's Creed came out that time. Call of Duty 4 came out that time. Mag, which is completely <laughs> underrated, in my opinion, and one of the best games ever should be played, if at mm. all possible. But, you know, there, there's just a it's an interesting time period. And I think it 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 gets discussed, but maybe not in the way that it should sometimes, because, you know, like you look at Call of Duty 4 and there was the the nuclear explosion halfway through and you have this <laughs> one it would you kindly you know do xyz and and i think there was a lot of really interesting commentary with all those games it's it's unfortunately kind of buried because it was in a in a in a weird period but it, it's an amazing game and and i i really think it it should be on anyone's radar that that is into gaming in any way it's very much that era of gaming too was very unique like early early 360 had some really interesting things happen. I think <laughs> oh, can, can it took some it. it took some real good chance. It took some really good chances with things, and you made some incredible games. Mm-hmm. So I, mean, uh, I my favorite gaming era, well, was Super Nintendo and early 360. Like I own more 360 games than anything. I own three bookshelves <laughs> worth of games I'll never play. But it's just that that era because also like the thing about Bioshock too is that. When and, you know, and especially this area of gaming is it's 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 approachable. It's not overly hard. I mean, you have the lower difficulty settings become a thing. You have games that 
help you at times. Like this game that we hadn't mentioned yet has an arrow all the time that will point to your objectives. Like little things like that that make the game so much more approachable for people, especially people that don't have time, like parents. <laughs> you know, yeah. it makes it so that you can enjoy a game that you might have never enjoyed otherwise. I think that's something yeah. that's very impressive about this era. So with uh, backpoints a little bit, you, Ian, you can't not talk about Bioshock without getting political. I think if you ever tried to like talk to someone about Bioshock and they're like, oh, you can't get political with Bioshock, they lost the complete, <laughs> complete point of the game. It's more of Andrew Ryan would be one of the people in the starter pack. If you idolize this guy, you're doing something you're wrong. Like you're yeah. an idiot or something like it's the same idea. Like you don't you can't idolize Andrew Ryan. He's not a good person. <laughs> Yeah. And then uh, I think Kevin Levine had hasn't said anything bad. I just think people think he's weird because he's never once backpedaled on the idea of, well, I mean, yeah, I think Bioshock Infinite story is great, sir. You have a story about a bunch of minorities and then you have the story one of the story is, well, if they become evil, then everyone's a monster. Like, no, they kind of have a right, sir. You you Mm kind of missed the point on that. I think that's really the only reason why people don't like him. Is because they're like, Infinite Story's bad. He's like, no, I wrote the the best trilogy ever. It's like, mm. Mm, I heard that Amazon is actively recruiting him for uh, <laughs> anti-union uh, uh, gigs. <laughs> You're not kidding, are you? <laughs> wow. Okay. I oh, can believe okay. it, though. <laughs> Never mind, then. I guess he is a butthole. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are just stupid sometimes. That's all I yeah. got. Some people really are dumb. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and make really bad decisions. The, the only other thing that I think we didn't touch upon is is probably the only reason why this game won't get a perfect score from me. I'm just not a fan of the final boss. No, we should yeah, we should definitely talk about that. It's not it's not a good fight. It's not a great fight. Like you're I basically watched... just go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's like you're basically just fine fighting a souped up big daddy. Like he dashes and he, you know, he maybe I bet then they, they get the idea. He's a big daddy with plasmids. And like, I'm I'm always the kind of dude, especially because I guess I was kind of raised on Final Fantasy. Uh, I'm used to having like a three stage boss fight minimum for my final bosses. And if you don't give me that, I'm going to be severely disappointed. <laughs> I think part three of it, stage boss encounter. <laughs> it's very much the era, in my opinion. It's just this era of video games you would have had to have something like this. I, I think that's a big part of it. I, I saw an interesting thing last night when I was kind of doing some final research for this, and somebody pointed out that the uh, final boss is the same guy on the cover of Atlas Shrugged. Oh, yes. Hmm. Okay, I did not notice that ever. <laughs> I, I I didn't realize it because I've never read the book either, but okay. yeah, somebody pointed out, they're like, hey, it's the same guy. They're blue, they're kind of muscular, looking kind of angry. And I was like, oh, I see that now. Well, yeah, that that's I guess it's supposed to be the idea that that's where he gets his name for like the original name Atlas from whenever he's telling you that, you know, I'm the Irishman Atlas. Uh, but that makes um, so much sense. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he, Fontaine's not original at all. <laughs> but, Fontaine's uh, also terrible. <laughs> yeah, he's an awful person, awful person, all in general. His, his whole idea is just to be in charge of a place where he can just steal money from people like like a, like a comedic cartoon villain. But I was trying to think where I was going with this. Uh, the I mean, the only is, thing, you know, he's he's terrible. Like he's just a terrible person. He's the reason that Rapture really goes to hell. I mean, Rapture was terrible to begin with, but you know, and he and his whole thing was he wanted to make more profit off Rapture than what Andrew Ryan was. He, so he wanted yeah, profit himself, him. something like that. But I mean, Ryan's a terrible guy. I can't say good when you say, "Are you a, are you Ryan the Lion or are you Peter the Parasite?" Like, yeah, there's no way to defend this guy. So, <laughs> so he's he's Trump before Trump, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> also with with it because uh, I, I did a lot of digging for about more than I ever have for a game for about like infinite. I know Kevin Levine also has stated through num- numerous times. I am not making a game based on the Civil War in Bioshock, which is the space between the ending of the ending of uh, burial at sea and the beginning of Bioshock one. He's like, I just like leaving it a mystery, which I can get why he would do that. But it's also a man. You're you're really like wasting pretty good money opportunity because i know hundreds of thousands of people that would totally totally play that yeah but i mean if star wars has taught us anything when you take a one line from a movie and then turn it into an entire trilogy of movies it doesn't always work out great yeah that's the other issue with it too i i, I like the i i want to say i like the idea of it but i'm also completely fine with the air of mystery with it as well i think there's books that cover some of it if i remember correctly i never read any of the books but i know there are books so i think the books might cover some of that era too 
because there was a book that came out along the time to- along the round the same time this game came out that kind of like connects to it which i've never read called rapture which i want to read someday for this show if i can find people but it so i mean there is that but mass effect did it halo did it so sometimes they you know that's the other part of the story gears of war did it doom gears did it did does doom have a book or the comics book has a doom has a four book series that came out in the mid 90s uh oh. it, i know it came out around the time i was in seventh or eighth grade because i did a book report on the first one in eighth grade and got an a and that somehow put me in honors english so awesome <laughs> that was a, the, the one time in middle school that i i did very very well they were interesting because they, they explained like the the main the doom guy his name was like flynn taggart or something he was very deeply irish catholic and so for hell to come to earth he was like you know dealing with his inner demon it actually wasn't terribly written okay it really spirals off about halfway through the series because it's like oh well okay we finished uh, hell on Earth. What do we do now? Let's send them to a different planet. It's like, all right. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, I think I want to say probably the biggest like slap in the face is the the Dead Space book that explains what Unitology is, and it's really really good. And if the only thing I say, if you're a Dead Space fan, I highly recommend it because it completely turns the series on its face. I love Dead Space. I yeah, do. Too. It's so good. Have you guys read the book? The book about Michael Altman or whatever the hell the founder is supposed to be? No. Uh uh-uh. it's really good and like i said it 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 explains a lot and why that why the the church is the way it is hmm. okay yeah i'll have to check that out someday then i oh do want God. to cover i do want to cover books on the show that have to do with games <laughs> Hasn't i go on amazon yet, after this and find out but i want to <laughs> so we will see if that day ever comes but it's definitely something that i have played with the idea in my mind multiple times but it hasn't come to fruition yet any last thing you guys want to say about Bioshock 1? And then we should, before we go on to Shelf Stacker Box? Nope. All right. I think we covered most things. Plus, I mean, the recovery episodes are always a little different because it's me recovering the games. So I don't want to go in the same amount of detail. I just want to kind of get that aspect of what it feels like to go back to a game that you already played, especially. And it's, it's definitely an interesting experience. I said at the top of the show, like you, you need to play all the Bioshocks and then not in a row and then go back to Bioshock 1 because you get a much different taste in your mouth that will you'll appreciate the game way more the way they wrap it all up. And so we're going to go shelf stacker box and I'll go first. I'm going to put this on the shelf. I, I had a great experience playing it again. I loved it. I fell more in love with this game than I expected myself to all over again. I appreciated things it does that Bioshock Infinite doesn't do. And it was just all around a good time. Like I was really grateful to have the opportunity because of Nomads of Fantasy to go and revisit this game and then record this episode too. So going on the shelf. Oh, what about you, Joe? Uh, this is totally going on the shelf. This game is a insta classic. I'm always a fan of games of, you know, if if you ever say like I, I my room, my roommates, I was talking to her about it and she's like, I've never played Bioshock. And I was like, I need to sit you down and let you play Bioshock because <laughs> I'm always a fan of like people in tr- like, first games and people know nothing about it. And it's like, oh, you're, you'll get a kick out of this. So it's shelf. And what about you, Ian? I agree. Um, I, I, again, I, I think it's a game that everybody that has any interest in gaming should play i think everybody's gonna have a unique experience off of it it's just it it's still it's starting to to age a little bit and you know it's 15 years and mechanics have jumped quite a bit since then but maybe not as much as you'd think and it's just a it's a solid game you know play through it on easy get the story you know and if you got interest go back again on a harder mode but yeah definitely definitely keeping it around for another playthrough maybe in a year okay and if you want to hear more Bioshock, <laughs> we have Bioshock for you. We have covered Bioshock Infinite, Episode 165, Bioshock 2, Minerva's Den, DLC Mini 16, Bioshock 2, Episode 143, Bioshock, the first time we did it, Episode 126. So this will be recovered 126. So you already would have known that. But And we did Barry OC, which has not been published at the time of this recording. It will be up around, it will be up, yeah, by the time you hear this, it's coming up <laughs> the week after I record this. So. It will be up. So definitely that will give you the whole Bioshock experience. If you just need more Bioshock and want to hear our opinion. So, <laughs> I mean, that's what I do. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can find all of our episodes on Podbean. Most things are on Spotify, iTunes. But they only go back 100 episodes, so you won't be able to hear some of the stuff that we just mentioned. So definitely go look at Podbean for all the content. I want to give a shout out to my awesome intro and outro courtesy of Helena at Hell Has Free. You can follow her on TikTok. She made our music. 
give a shout out to my buddy Bill Tucker, who did the MCU roundup with me. He started his own podcast, The Gamer Looks Up For You. Definitely go give him a listen. And if you enjoyed this, we do comics, we do movies, we do TV season, we do all sorts of tons of episodes. Definitely go check out our gigantic catalog. We'll find plenty of things to keep you busy and keep you awake at a, if you work third shift or something, for example. So that's all I got, and we will see you guys all next time. Oh, and we have a Patreon. Patreon, how the fuck did I forget that? We have a Patreon. Little dog, you can go vote in our Patreon, help out the show. Would you kindly go vote in our Patreon? Hey, give me a dollar, please. Helps cover the show expenses. And please follow Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube now. I'm done. I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. See ya.